So this is the last thing I want to talk about, and the last thing I would want to open the video with. But it was recently brought to my attention that somebody is impersonating me on Facebook. And even worse, asking for money. So right off the get-go, if anybody is ever asking you for money under the name of John Levi, it's not me. I'll never do such a thing. I do have a Facebook page, and this is it. And you'll recognize my things, and I recently posted a couple things indicating that this is my official website. It is a group, or a page, or something like that. It looks like I have 2,000 followers. And here I'll show you the fake page real quick. Again, another look at my own, and what it looks like at the top. This reset passport. And here, if you do a search for John Levi, but just under people, we see, like, the fifth one. And this was brought to my attention in the last video. People were asking me if I'm running a page that's asking for money, and I said no. So let's look at this person's page. Here we go. So he's put this melted building up here, and having a thousand followers or friends, and this is really obviously not me. But he is acting as if he's me, and this is very sad. And here I think this is actually him, and his family, or this is someone that he's raising money for under my name. But if you have the ability, do report this person and unfriend him and let me know what I should do to get this resolved. This impersonating of myself and I hope none of you have donated to him. And again, let me show you my page and maybe it's what I get for neglecting this platform. So with all those unpleasantries out of the way, I thank you for being here, and welcome. And here I just want to show a monument in Raleigh, North Carolina. This was shared by Stuffed Beagle. And it's a great chair. I don't even know where to begin. The Confederate Monument. It's this great big monument, 75 feet tall, in front of the state capitol in North Carolina. In 1892, we're told it was built. No photos or explanations. We're told the Secretary of State, Octavius Koch, held a meeting of members of the Ladies' Memorial Association, which we see a lot of, as if that explains the erection of all these glorious monuments. Here, let's just watch this video. This is a local news agency in North Carolina. And I'd like to dig into this a little more. Why were they removing all the monuments in North Carolina in 2020? But nonetheless, they took the top part off, and then they brought in one crane, and it was inadequate. Then they brought in a second crane, and it was still inadequate. The straps began buckling, and they had to drill holes into the monument, and wait for a third crane to show up. And finally, with three cranes, they were able to move this thing. And how did this go down in the 1800s, is my question. Three cranes to put it in place and move it in 2020. And how did they accomplish this in the late 1800s? With no cranes and horse and pulleys. I want to start out with this clock in Prague. I just love this clock. Here, another little look at it. And this clock was first installed in 1410, making it the third oldest astronomical clock in the world, and the oldest clock still in operation today. The clock is attached to the old town hall in Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic. And here we can see the old town hall. We see some tech on the top, and another clock, 
a newer clock compared to this other one we're looking at. And we can actually see the new Roman numeral 4, now depicted as four lines. Some say this is a Mandela effect, and here we can see 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is four lines. And if we can see in this example of the 4, in the old clock, 4 is depicted as 1 V. And this clock we're looking at must be on the other side here. And let's have a look at the entrance to the old town hall. Ah yes, how we love the old. Unbelievable is what this is, making the heart pound a little. Just remarkable. And consider your town hall. And perhaps this door is massive. I'm sure it is. The clock is mounted on the southern wall of the old town hall in the old town square. Just glorious. All the ground covered in brick, like a fairy tale city. The square features buildings belonging to various architectural styles, including Gothic Church of Our Lady, as seen here. More on that later. So, okay, back on point. The clock was installed in 1410. And just to give a feel for the size of it, we have some doorways on either side. It looks like one of the doorways, or perhaps just the facading for a false doorway, has crumbled off here. And much of this ornamental detail, as we see here, has broken off on this side. And we just see the base of whatever all this ornamentation must have been attached to. These statues don't look like they belong here, and they've even built some cheap wire cages to protect them from falling on tourists, I'm sure. I could be wrong, we'll have to look at old photos to determine that. And here we can see a flat projection of our realm in the center, again from the 1400s, if we were to subtract the added thousand years, we're talking about the year 400. And this thing is just mind-blowing. Okay, so I've said it before in a past video, but I think this clock is the greatest clock in the realm. I think it's absolutely inclusive of everything that we need to understand. Aha, uh -huh, in 1629, the wooden statues were added. And in 1865, the golden figure of a crowing rooster was added. They tell us it's a device used in medieval astronomy. And as we know, there is no medieval. This is from the past civilization. Here they're trying to tell us one may consider it to be a primitive planetarium displaying the current state of the universe. The dial has a background that represents the standing earth and sky. Now this makes more sense. And surrounding four main moving components, the zodiac ring, an outer rotating ring, an icon representing the sun, and an icon representing the moon. The background represents the earth and the local view of the sky. The blue circle directly in the center represents the earth, and the upper blue is the portion of the sky which is above the horizon. The red and black areas indicate portions of the sky below the horizon. During the daytime, the sun sits over the blue part of the background, and at night it sits over the black. During dawn or dusk, the mechanical sun is positioned over the red part of the background. Written on the eastern part of the horizon is aurora, dawn in Latin, and ortus, rising. On the western right part is Ocasus, or sunset, and crepusculum, or twilight. Golden Roman numerals at the outer edges of the blue circle are the time scale of the normal 24-hour day and indicate time in local prog time, or Central European time. Curved golden lines dividing the blue part of the dial into 12 parts are marks for unequal hours. These hours are defined as a twelfth of the time between sunrise and sunset, and vary as the days grow longer or shorter during the year. The zodiac ring. Inside the large black outer circle lies another movable circle, marked with the signs of the zodiac, which indicate the location of the sun on the ecliptic. 
The signs are shown in anti-clockwise order. In the photograph accompanying this section, the sun is currently moving anti-clockwise from Cancer into Leo. The displacement of the zodiac circle results from the use of a stereographic projection of the ecliptical plane using the North Pole as the basis of the projection. This is commonly seen in astronomical clocks of the period. The small golden star shows the position of the vernal equinox, and side real time can be read on the scale with golden Roman numerals. The zodiac is on the 366 tooth gear inside the machine. This gear is connected to the sun gear and the moon gear by a 24 tooth gear. At the outer edge of the clock, golden Schwabacher numerals are set on a black background, a German type of lettering, and look at this mind-blowing city. These numerals indicate old check time or Italian hours with 24 indicating the time of sunset, which varies during the time of year from as early as 1600 in winter to 2016 in summer. The ring moves back and forth during the year to coincide with the time of sunset. The golden sun moves around the zodiac circle, showing its position on the ecliptic. Unbelievable is what this clock is, spinning in all different directions, every part functional. And here's a little look at the inner gear workings. So much more to discuss, but let's move on to the calendar. As if there wasn't enough going on with this clock, we have this absolutely mind-blowing calendar. All of these entries surrounding the entire perimeter, and I'm actually pleased that somebody even gives us something. Here we can have a closer look, and what are these entries? All these letters, numbers, some sort of cipher or code. And they say the calendar plate below the clock was replaced by a copy in 1880. The original is stored in the Prague City Museum. That's great, I'd love to have a little look at that. On the edge of the circle is a church calendar with fixed holidays and the names of 365 saints. I think this is suspicious. I think the 365 is going to coincide with the days, and perhaps that is what they changed. So pretty heavy, and just turning a little dirt today, but I thought we'd just peek at this clock of the old world. And I'm pretty easy on myself. I should be working on this video right now, but I don't want to. And that's okay, I don't think we should be very hard on ourselves. And in this last video, I will have shown you this date of erection at the San Francisco Union Terminal Building. And here we can see it. It's very important, I think, that I pause it over and over to really give a feeling that this date is not a fluke. And I'll pause it at a certain point if I can, because many people want to see a one. And here you go, you can see this distortion in the film. Here we go. You see that line running through everything, running through the columns, running through the whole plaque. And a lot of people want to say that this is a one. If you don't study the film carefully, you'll think that this little glitch, I mean, this glitch, what is a glitch? This glitch is just too perfectly spaced here, right in front of this 896, but it is not 1896. And this is a glitch, as you can see here. And let me unpause it real quick. Boom. Glitch gone. 896. Now, I was showing this to a friend today. And we were trying our damnedest on the Google Earth here to really get into this plaque and see. Here, it looks like it does not have a 1. But very difficult to get in here. And here, I'll just show you the building, as long as we're standing in front of it. And, you know, we always thought this was the Union Terminal building, or at least I did. And, in fact, it's not even the Union Terminal building. It's the San Francisco Ferry Building. Ah, the Ferry Building. So important to be this massive. And it is a super cool building. Let me show you 
what it looks like from above here. Here we go. Just as we saw in that old film footage, the little train comes slamming into this, what we thought was a Union type of terminal hub. But in fact, no. It was actually a ferry building. A terminal for ferries that would travel across the bay, a food hall, and an office building. Designed in 1892, the ferry building was completed in 1898. Six years. At its opening, it was the largest project undertaken in the city up to that time for a ferry. It's like the ferry is going to park in the building. But no, the largest project years before the Great Earthquake with a clock tower 245 feet tall and ultimately the narrative sounds like all the other narratives. A decrease in use leading up to the 1950s and eventually they tell us they built the bridges and the entire complex is pretty much abandoned from its original purpose and turns into office space and a little tourism. Here a little look in 1912, and what do we see up here? 915? And today we see a picture that looks like this. It looks like they have added a 1. It looks like they've added the AD. When would somebody put AD before the date? And again, if we look here, in which I think it's most clear, there simply is no 1. Just that glitch as I've shown you. And I'm not trying to make any point here. Who cares, ultimately. But for me, it's just an encouragement to live your life as you would, without being encumbered by any false authorities. There are none. And if anything, all of this glory of the old world should encourage us to pull our own heads out of our asses and make this place better, or fight the tyranny that would seek to oppress us and keep us from a better world. But again, maybe it doesn't matter. The I Ching says our greatest treasure is our peace of mind. And I think everyone can attain this, no matter what their situation or regional situations. And I thought we would just go bonus for a second. Here I just got a comment talking about the Chicago World's Fair comparing it to the modern, present-day Dubai World's Fair, telling us if they could do this in Dubai, what's the big deal with pulling some lumber together a hundred years ago? Is that so difficult to fathom, he asks us. Pulling some lumber together a hundred years ago. Is it just a case of pulling some lumber together? Just to slap up some temporary World's Fair? Because all I have is my own life experience to share and compare this narrative to, I will share my response with him. I told him that I've recently built a 400 square foot cabin. Not a hundred years ago, but today. I used approximately 250 pieces of wood, and these of course would have been 2x4x8s, by by ranging all the way to 12 footers. My roof required 2x6s, and all the sheeting on the walls was 4x8 OSB, a cheap kind of plywood. This is approximately 1.6 pieces of wood per square foot. To move all this wood took about 20 trips to the lumber yard with my 400 horsepower truck. 400 horses packed under that hood. Quite the advantage over the modes used 100 years ago. Using this formula and applying it to a million square foot World's Fair building, we would require 1,600,000 pieces of wood per building. Now, they weren't all a million square feet. Some were less and some were bigger. Let's say there were only 50 buildings, even though there were more. That's 80 million pieces of wood to construct 50 buildings. And I'm glad he posed this question. 80 million pieces of wood in this early time period, only to be disposed of a year later, does not make sense. Enough wood to build a city. This would have halted and slowed the supply for the rest of the city, again, in this early time period. So just something to think about. We thank you for the comment. 
And in my last video I said I would talk about the transatlantic cable. They supposedly laid this cable in 1858. Laying the cable across the ocean. We're told the first one was laid in the 1850s. From Ireland to Newfoundland. But it sucked. And it failed after three weeks. A complete waste of all their efforts and investments. And that's okay, because it only took them four years. Four years of work for something that functioned for only three weeks. Really risky of them. The second cable was laid in 1865 with improved materials. More than halfway across the cable broke, and after many rescue attempts, it was abandoned. And once again in 1866, a third cable was laid, and this one was successful. Line speed was very good, and the slogan, two weeks to two minutes, was coined to emphasize the great improvement over the ship-borne dispatches. And let's look at the means back then. Here we go. Laying cables across the Atlantic. These guys. And here they had a parade to celebrate. Very exciting. And we'll get back to this in a minute. Next, I want to just show this. I also featured it in my last video. And this is the Jantar Montar in the city of New Delhi. Jantar Montar literally means instruments for measuring the harmony of the heavens. It consists of 13 architectural astronomy instruments. The site is one of five built by Maharaja Jai Singh II of Jaipur. Jaipur is the capital city of the Indian state of Rajasthan. And this Mr. Singh, we'll call him, not only built this site but several, beginning in 1723. 1723, and let's have a look at it. These are the remains from 1723. There we go. Actually looking very modern, really interesting. Only because they have stuccoed over the old stonework. Or brick, or both. Clearly stuccoed. And really interesting, if this is a timekeeping device used to observe the luminaries, and so may all of the amphitheaters. Very interesting, this little clue that an amphitheater may simply be missing the rest of its parts. Here we can see the rest of the parts. This dial, and I'm not sure what we're seeing here. This looks modern. And my favorite was the old photo of it. Here we go. And what do they say? 1858, damaged by fighting during the Indian Rebellion of 1857. What kind of weapons were they using in the Indian Rebellion of 1857? And one final share that I want to dig into much more. This is more of a reference for myself. The Broadwater Natatorium in Helena, Montana. What is going on in Helena, Montana? Let's just have a little peek here. Absolutely mind-blowing in the mountains of Montana. And this will require its own video. Let's look at a little tunnel under here. Here we go. The interior of the natatorium in Helena. Unbelievable. Reminding me of Lex Luthor's secret mansion under the subway in Superman. But for today, I think that's it. And this has always been my dream house. But for today, I thank you for joining me. And do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.